I told you guys in my CPU complaints video about how the CPU market is just so oversaturated now with too many SKUs and stuff. Remember there were 35 of them in current generation between Intel and AMD. I said I was gonna kind of move on to the topic of motherboards uh, when it comes to buyer advice and sort of just some whiny complaints that I have about the current motherboard landscape and then give you guys some advice on how to just cut through the fluff and get what you need and save some money. DK Waterblocks is a premier leader when it comes to all things water cooling. Their lineup includes fittings, tubing, tools, radiators, fans, pumps, coolants, and of course, water blocks. The Vector 2 Series GPU blocks utilize a 10 millimeter thick copper cold plate and a 3D machined acrylic jet insert for improved flow distribution and thermal performance. Every Vector 2 water block includes a high grade aluminum back plate that encloses the entire GPU with its distinctive L-shaped profile for increased rigidity and cooling surface area. And right now, EK Waterblocks has discounted all NVIDIA 30 Series GPU blocks at 50% off making this the best time to finally upgrade the cooling of your 30 series GPU. But don't wait, this deal is only valid while supplies last. To learn more, follow the sponsored link in the description below. So what I have sitting in front of me right now is kind of a plethora of some motherboards that I just randomly grabbed. And considering the fact that I've been building some more systems uh, over the last six months, when I'm specking out a system, it's just, <sighs> you start to realize there's just too many options. It's like, even this video, it's kind of like, where do you start in trying to make a point and talking about the fact that just like graphics cards have gotten more and more expensive over the years, so have motherboards. But I don't feel like motherboards are something that needed to continue to get more over spec and expensive, but they have. For instance, let's go back to this motherboard right here. This is an old FX uh, AMD CPU. Wow, it's so light, it's just, weird feeling. Anyway, this is an old uh, AMD FX CPU motherboard, and this is the GA990 FX A UD3. The UD3 was one of my most recommended motherboards of the era because of the cost to performance, the feature set that you got for it. Uh, shout out to the PCI slot still existing on here, by the way, uh, in an era when PCI was already pretty much phased out. Anyway, moving on, it didn't have anything super fancy. It never was flat because it twists when it's just sitting there under all the tension that the coolers and stuff put on there, but you know, it would flatten out as you melt. Uh. It's supposed to do that. Part of the design. Anyway, it just, it had what you needed. All right, we had one, two, three, four, five, six PCI Express slots. A couple of them are one X and then we had a uh, 16 X and then, you know, this is eight X, that's a four X. But anyway, I digress. It gave you what you needed. It got the job done. Four dim slots and it was robust. And if you got the Rev 3 or higher, it was reliable. This motherboard was like $100 or so at the time. Moving on, what was considered an expensive motherboard at the time was something like this MSI M Power. This is back when MSI had basically three tiers of product. They had the gaming tier, which had red accents. They had like the productivity tier or their mainstream tier, which had the blue accents. And then they had their overclocking tier, which was their yellow accents. And it was simple. It was like small, medium, and large in terms of what you wanted to get. This board feels significantly heavier than the Gigabyte counterpart. This is a Z7, a Z97, I almost said Z790, if that shows you how far we've come. This is a Z97 chipset with a 4770K currently installed. By the way, subscribe if you guys aren't, if you're interested in the fact that we are gonna be hooking up this over 10 year old system now, well, about 10 years old, to see how it handles today's games in low settings and stuff to see if you're running something this old, is it time to upgrade? So anyway, subscribe if you're interested in that video. But moving on, if you wanna know how old this is too, this is fourth gen Intel, Intel Core. We are on 13th gen, so do the math on that. Anyway, moving on, this motherboard at the time was about 280-ish dollars, depending on, you know, if you could find a sale or something. Yeah, back then, the prices advertised are the prices that they were. Imagine that. Moving on though, this is what was considered an expensive motherboard. If you wanted something exotic, You'd get something like this EVGA classified SR2. Yeah, the pins are smashed on this, but this was given to us just for display piece because I love the way it looked. This is when it was like super custom, dual proc obviously on here. Just a complete one-off, super high-end, balls to the wall type of build when EVGA was still like kind of doing that sort of stuff. Guess how much this motherboard cost? 569 bucks at the time. All the articles and stuff were like, this is such an expensive system, but it was also a very off 
like edge case and it comes when it comes to use cases and stuff. Well, let's talk about current pricing, right? This is the Z670E uh, Crosshair Hero motherboard from AM from uh, Asus Republic of Gamers for the new you know AM5 chipset or AM5 socket and new chipset for AMD's 7000 series processors. This is the same motherboard I'm using in my personal build at home. This is actually the bad one. That kind of leans into some of the complaints I have about the fact that you can even get a bad motherboard in with, with the cost that they are. This motherboard is not top spec. This motherboard is not top of the line. And it's also technically the most expensive motherboard, second most expensive motherboard I've ever used in any of my high-end builds at $700. Spending $700 on a motherboard is like outrageous. Nobody should have to spend that kind of money on a motherboard. It shouldn't need to exist. Shows the guy who's actually running one. Yeah, I know, okay, so I digress. Ugh. This guy is the same motherboard, but it's the Crosshair Extreme. This MSRP'd at $1,200, but I'm actually seeing them on like Newegg and Amazon for about a thousand. This is the first time I've seen something go below MSRP for the most part because of the fact that people are not really shopping $1,200 motherboards. This one component costs as much as this entire build did back when I used this motherboard. This was my personal motherboard. I, I used this system personally. So how did we get here? First of all, how we got here has nothing to do with chipset or cost of chipset or any of that. It has even less to do with like the quality of the components that are on the motherboard. Because back during this era of like the M-Power and the Gigabyte, um, ultra durable, the UD stands for ultra durable by the way. That was like advertising solid Japanese capacitors. You know, it was like better chokes, multi-layer PCB, you know, that kind of stuff, which is all true. However, those components themselves do not raise the motherboard prices 3X or 4X in terms of cost. What you've started to experience now is competition amongst the motherboard brands themselves, one upping each other on a feature to the point where we've leapfrogged ourselves now to thousand dollar motherboards. So back then, back here, you'll notice there's no M.2, there's no MVME, it didn't exist yet. In fact, the biggest thing you'd find people asking on motherboard reviews back then and, and finding and seeing the USB 3.0 header on here, like this was like amongst the first era where you're finding it on, on the motherboard standard. And you can find it here as well on the, uh, on the UD. But look, we had three USB 2 headers right there and a 1394 Firewire, which is kind of rare. Yeah, I haven't heard that in forever. <laughs> but it, again, times were different. What you started seeing were companies start to one-up each other on features. So how many SATA 6 ports did it have? Was it, you know, SATA 6 or was it SATA 3? You know, that kind of thing. And so now we're finding motherboards that have OLED, screens on them. They have Q code readouts. They have live voltage monitoring headers, multiple USB 3.0, USB-C built in, Thunderbolt. Um, how many M.2 slots does it have? How many layers is the PCB? Is it made out of solid gold? You know, to the point to where these features over time have started adding cost and cost and cost. And as the motherboards got more robust, the VRM coolers, like the, the chunks of aluminum they're sitting on here to keep them cooler have gotten a bit more, well, I mean, if we compare it to like the UD, <laughs> right? They've gotten a little bit more robust. But again, that doesn't add three to four times the cost. What has kind of led to a lot of where we are today just is unfortunately inflation with, within the tech community itself. And this is, this is not even like COVID related. This is a trend that was going along for a long time. So motherboard manufacturers would absolutely love to have you believe you have to buy their high end stuff to get the ultimate experience. Now I have a couple motherboards on this table uh, that I have purchased that are great examples of motherboards that aren't going to quote unquote break the bank but they are absolutely going to give you a solid uh, platform to build your system on without all the extra cost associated with it. So the first one I have right here, this is the Asus Z690 Tough. This is actually a D4, which means it is a uh, DDR4 version of the motherboard. So it doesn't use DDR5, which is perfectly fine. But you'll notice here, we don't have like 
funky solid covers everywhere, making it so you can't see any of the PCB. Cause that's one of the things you'll notice too, as the motherboards get more expensive, you see less of the board and it's, really freaking heavy like this armor thing on the back is nice it helps you potentially not short stuff out but again all these things lead to cost but the tough comes in at about uh, 269 dollars and here's the funny thing remember when i said that was how much the top tier cost back then i see a lot of people now questioning how good a 200 hundred dollar motherboard could be back in the day and i say back in the day i'm talking about like when i started my youtube channel in 2012 we would i would recommend a lot of $79 motherboards all day long because the motherboard, the motherboard just did its job. Things connected to it and that was all there was to it. It, it, it completed the connections amongst the components and, the, and then the BIOS handled everything else. It was, it worked. There was just none of this extra tier stuff. So you'll notice this doesn't have an OLED screen on it. Heck, does it even have a Q code readout? It does not. It's going to have debug LEDs though. Just about every motherboard these days has an LED that will light up red if something's wrong and it'll tell you on the manual or at least on the PCB written out, CPU, hard drive, GPU, whatever. You can build a solid system off of a $250 motherboard and feel perfectly fine about it. And it just absolutely blows my mind that I'm having to say that right now and convince someone that $250 is an okay price to spend on a motherboard because it's not too cheap. A $250 motherboard 10 years ago was just like the top of the line. That's, that's the thing. This right here is the MSI MPG Edge motherboard. Why is it sticky? It's actually sticky. Anyway, moving on, <laughs> it's sticky. I don't know why. It's performance goop. Corsair brings gaming to the next level with the Xenion 45 inch flexible OLED Xenion Flex display. With up to 240 hertz refresh rate, 0.03 millisecond gray to gray response time, motion blur canceling, anti-reflective coating, burn-in protection, and customizable bend based on user's preference, the Xenion Flex from Corsair allows gamers to truly tailor their display to their liking. Click the link below for more details. Uh, again, you'll see this motherboard doesn't have a Q code readout. It doesn't have an OLED screen. It doesn't have anything flashy. It does actually have, you know, covers down here. You're going to find most motherboards these days are going to have, you know, three M.2 slots, at least minimum two. They're probably going to have three, one under here, probably two under here, right there. This is potentially even another one, but it's again, this is a $299 motherboard. I bought this, I bought two of these on Amazon actually just to have on hand for builds. And it's funny because I bought the MSI brand one specifically because of the fact that um, I was having so many issues with Asus boards lately. I'm like, it's just time to try another brand just to see what's been, what's happening. But this has, you know, plenty of SATA on there. It's got your USB-C, it's got your USB 3.0, your 24 pin header, four slots for your RAM, plenty of uh, fan headers. It's got your ARGB headers, your 12 volt RGB headers. And it'll support up to 13900K with overclocking. It's perfectly fine. You know, I've seen it when we go to Micro Center. I see as many people standing in front of the, the CPU cabinet with their phones doing research, trying to pick a CPU, as I do seeing people stand at the motherboard aisle, looking at different motherboard boxes, trying to make sense of what's what and what the difference is. Because now you'll have like a Wi-Fi and a non-Wi-Fi version of every motherboard. And let me tell you right now, with the cost of motherboards, there is no reason whatsoever for any motherboard not to come with, with Wi-Fi integrated into it, period. Any motherboard manufacturer that is charging extra for a Wi-Fi variant of a motherboard is doing so just because they can. And it's, in my opinion, it's, it's screwed up because at their cost, I guarantee it, it, it is negligible to be able to install it and not have to raise the price on the customer and have one SKU. So what I'm gonna take a look at right now is uh, I'm gonna look at Newegg and I'm gonna see, just randomly looking at some motherboard tabs on here or, or motherboard uh, SKUs, what do they cost? So, okay, sort by price highest sold by Newegg. I don't want the marketplace stuff because again, that's just that's just crazy. So it's funny, some of their oldest, their, or their, their most expensive stuff is actually um, older generation by a couple gens. And I think sometimes that has to do with someone needing an older gen motherboard. Like when we had a garage sale, the amount of people that were telling me like, Jay, I need this particular chipset because I have this CPU and I need to reuse it in this build. And do you have this? Yes, I have some older stuff. And they're like, yes, and it all sold. So if that tells you anything. Anyway, it's Asus RG Maximus 8 Extreme, which is a Z590 board for $1,390. Um, we have the Asus Pro WSW790 Sage, uh, which again is a, it's a PCIe 5.0. This is a workstation board for $1,300. Asus ROG Crosshair 
X670E Extreme, if I translate that, it's actually Asus Republic of Gamers Crosshair Extreme 670 Extreme Extreme, $998. What does the Extreme do that this doesn't? Has an extra Extreme in the name. This is an EATX board, okay? Um, it has much bigger power delivery system in terms of phases and stuff. It has the 90 degree header, uh, 90 degree stuff on there because it's EATX. This also really limits how many cases it's gonna fit in. Full cover down here, but it's gonna have like four M.2 slots down here. It's got a 10 gig ethernet and a two and a half gig ethernet. It's got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight USB three super speeds. It's got one, two, three, four USB-C slash Thunderbolts on here. Um, Actually, none of them are Thunderbolt technically, but two of them are DisplayPort outs. But the thing is like, is this worth $400 more than that? Because think about it, I could buy that, and I can't believe I'm using this as an example of value. <laughs> I could buy the Crosshair Hero and have $400 to put towards the CPU, which could honestly pay for the CPU. But in what, in what planet should you pair a motherboard that's more expensive than the CPU with the CPU that's cheaper than it? Like I, I, all day long, I would say, spend $250 on a motherboard and spend $500 on like a 13900K or a 7950X level CPU and profit. And by profit, I mean just have some sort of value there. There's, there's the expensive motherboards. It's just a trend I hate to see because I, I love PC building. I want everyone to have a computer and be able to build a computer. But the problem is when the when your low end entry level stuff now is approaching approaching the pricing that the high level stuff was 10 years ago, this is more than just inflation. This is artificially inflated at this point. Because even if you do the price conversions, they're nowhere near where they are today. So I know this video probably just kind of seemed all over the place, but I feel better when I vent about this sort of stuff. The brands say they're listening. They say they take the kind of stuff we as creators say seriously. I feel like they should maybe prove it by having more entry-level products that are under $200. Again, a sentence that sounds so weird to say because to me an entry-level motherboard would be like $55, which is what you could spend a while back. Yes, you have the B-series motherboards. Yes, you have uh, both B-series for Intel and B-series for AMD because they're all just copying each other now on naming. But the reality is there's even less SKUs available to you there. And less, and it's just, they spend all their time marketing Z-series stuff. But Jay, you have only Z-series stuff on the table. Yeah, because guess what? That's the only crap they'll really send us. Yeah, we I think we have two B-series motherboards for modern gen stuff sitting out there. Um, and the problem is if you go and you shop between the two, you'll find there's not much cost difference between a B-series motherboard and a Z-series motherboard. So at that point, you're like, you might as well at least get the Z-series motherboards because you are getting BIOS feature sets and unlocked overclockability for a few extra bucks. And to me, that's worth it with what we do. Maybe not for you. All right. Anyway, enough of that. Enough complaining and stuff. Just when you're shopping for motherboards, really honestly ask yourself, do you need the extra features that are on the motherboard? The Extreme over the Hero, this, the, these are next to each other in the SKU lineup. That's how much of a price gap that there is. There is no feature on the Crosshair Hero uh, that doesn't exist that I would need the Extreme for, if that makes sense. They both have OLED screens. They both have, you know, um, well, the irony is if you look at today's motherboards, they have even less PCI Express slots than they used to back in the day. So ask yourself, are you really getting anything for the money? 200 to $250, that's as much as anyone should ever have to spend on a motherboard. Take the extra money and put it into uh, your CPU or your GPU. Like I've said, there's ways you can save money on a build and you don't, you don't need this level stuff. Thanks for listening.